So Ezekiel then in chapter 34 to 39 effectively is, is detailing the restoration of Israel uh, as you're going through it in your, in your Bible classes. And it, and it goes through um, the restoration of Israel, the, the same events, but from various different perspectives. Uh, so in chapter 35, you, uh, I believe it was Bernard who dealt with the perspective that Mount Seir has, Ijumir and Edom, on the restoration of Israel and, and how it is from their eyes. Uh, and then here in chapter 36, it's the mountains of Israel themselves. The Lord uh, God through Ezekiel speaks to them and says, Hear ye this um, word of the Lord, O mountains of Israel. Uh, and then the prophet, inspired by God, details to them who was going to occupy them at various points in history. And, and he details them from their scattering in AD 70 all the way up to their complete restoration of Israel upon those mountains of Israel. And one thing that all of these chapters have in common um, in Ezekiel 35, well, two, well, probably more than two things, but, but two things that we want to bring our attention to. Firstly, they all mention and they're all focused upon the mountains of Israel. That's where the restoration, the nucleus of the kingdom of God starts. And secondly, I can't remember the second bit, we'll come back to that. Ezekiel 34 verse 13 says this. It says, um, I, I remember, it, it's that the restoration of Israel is done in two phases. A pre advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, restoration on the mountains, and then the post-return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the full restoration on the mountains. And all of these chapters detail these two phases. Now, Ezekiel 34 says this concerning the mountains of Israel. It says, I will bring them, the Jews, well, scattered Jewry uh, from the diaspora of Israel. It says, I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them to their own land. And notice this, and feed them on the mountains of Israel. So they're going to come back, yes, to the land of Israel, of course, but specifically to the mountains of Israel, by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. Focus on the mountains of Israel. I will feed, verse 14, them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel. That's where the restoration of the Jews is going to begin, on the mountains of Israel, before the Lord returns. Ezekiel 35, verse 12, says... And thou shalt know, speaking through the eyes of Mount Seir, thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and that I have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, they are laid desolate, they are given to us to consume. So Mount Seir looked at the mountains of Israel, when God took the Jews out of the land and scattered them amongst the nations to the four winds, Ijumea, Edom, Mount Seir, whatever we want to call them, looked at the mountains of Israel, and they thought that that was God giving them the mountains of Israel, that they might occupy them and consume them. Thus, verse 13, with your mouth you have boasted against me and have multiplied your words against me. And I, he says, I have heard them. Okay, so then we come to chapter 36. And and, and the mountains of Israel are addressed directly. Also, thou son of man, prophesy unto the mountains of Israel. And this was going to be God's message to the mountains of Israel. We've just read it so we won't read it again, which is effectively they've been desolated for so long that before, before the Lord comes, God's going to restore Israel back to the mountains. So they're going to be scattered, but then they're going to come back. Verse 8, you mountains of Israel, you will shoot forth your branches, he says. And this is phase one of the restoration of Israel. Before the Lord comes, he says, you will shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people of Israel. Not I, Jumir, but my people of Israel. For he says they are at hand to come. So the prophet says they are going to come back. They are at hand to come, not yet return, but they're coming back. And when they do come back, verse 9, I will, he says, I am for you and I will turn unto you, mountains of Israel, and you shall be tilled and sown. So he says that Israel are going to come back from from being scattered. So Israel and Judah, both back in the land, those two sticks being joined together. He says Israel are going to come back to the mountains of Israel and they're going to basically engage in agriculture. They're going to be, they're going to till and sow the mountains of Israel. And verse 10 then says, I will multiply men upon you, not Edom, but all the house of Israel, Judah and Israel, the both of them, all the house of Israel, even all of it, it says, and it says the cities of of the mountains of Israel, it says, shall be inhabited, the wastes shall be builded, and I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit, and I will settle you after your old estates, and will do better unto you than at your beginnings, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so when we talk about the mountains of Israel, we remember that the Jews came back in 1948. They came back to the land of Israel. But in 1948, they did not come back to the mountains of Israel. 
they came back to the coastal plain on the west by the Mediterranean Sea. It was only in 1967, in that six-day war, when Israel got back the mountains of Israel. And all these prophecies, the first stage of Israel's restoration from 1967 began. The mountains of Israel started to be, verse 8, 9, 10 of Ezekiel 36, started to be inhabited by the whole house of Israel. And then it's chapter 37 again that says this in verse 22. It says, I will make them one nation in the land. And where's God going to do it? He's going to make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. That's when Judah and Israel are going to be joined together on the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. So that's the second stage. That's when the Lord has come back and they have their king. And then chapter 38, interesting, isn't it? Verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited. Where does God come down to? In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. So this is the same prophecy but through the eyes of Gog. And it says Gog's going to come back to a people that are already brought back from the sword. So before the Lord comes, Israel are brought back from the sword and they're gathered out of many people and Gog comes against the mountains of Israel which have been always waste but it's brought forth out of the nations, and they, Israel, shall dwell safely, all of them. So before the Lord comes, and before Go comes down, Israel are dwelling on the mountains of Israel. That began in 1967, and they're there now, dwelling on the mountains of Israel, waiting for the Gogin invasion to come. And so Go comes. But this is what happens to Go, chapter 39, verse 2. It says, I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north part. So Gog comes from the north. And God says, I will bring you, Gog, upon the mountains of Israel. That's where they come to. Why? Well, we'll look at that later. Why do they come to the mountains of Israel? Very interesting why they come to the mountains. Verse 3 says, I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand. And I will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. So Gog comes down and God takes the bow out of Gog's left hand. He takes the arrows out of Gog's right hand. And says, you, Gog, verse 4, you will fall upon the mountains of Israel. You and all of your bands and the people that are with you. So the whole confederacy come to the mountains of Israel and God destroys them there. I will give you unto the ravenous burst, be, the beasts, birds, slow down, and the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. And it says, thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, Seth. The Lord God, and it says a bit later on that seven months, I think it's verse 11, seven months or around there, verse 12, seven months shall the house of Israel be burying Gog on the mountains of Israel, that they may cleanse the land. So that's really what's going to happen to the mountains of Israel. It's going to be inhabited before the Lord comes. So, so before 1967, um, on the west there, by the Mediterranean Sea, that's what Israel were given in their 1948, the armistice borders of 1949. They were given the coastal plain, but not, you can see the green line. Um, it's actually called the green line or the armistice borders. And, and that's the mountains of Israel there on the north. Israel didn't have that land, they had the coastal plain. So these prophecies weren't, at this point, being fulfilled. Israel were not occupying the mountains of Israel. They, at this point, was still 1948 to 1967, the, the mountains of Israel were still desolate and waste. But God says to, to the mountains of Israel in chapter 36, Israel will come and they will inhabit you. So what Ezekiel 36 effectively does, um, the first 15 verses, it details phase one of the restoration of Israel, which is the pre-advent of the Lord Jesus Christ restoration. And then uh, it talks uh, for, for, for a while, verse 16 to 23, about and, and speaks to Israel about why God, in the first place, scattered them off the mountains of Israel. And then verse 24 onwards, then details phase two of the restoration. Phase one is the physical restoration to the land. Phase two is the spiritual restoration of that nation on the mountains of Israel. Which is why, verse 24, it says, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you. Bring you to your own land. And then it talks, verse 25, sprinkling clean water on you. Um, get rid of all your idols and your filthiness, 25. Uh, a new heart, a new way, a new spirit, verse 26, is given to them. The stony heart taken away. Uh, verse 27, God's spirit is put on them. None of this has happened. This is all in the future. 
after the Lord has come back. The spiritual restoration of the people of Israel. But first, before the Lord comes, they're physically restored to the land. And this is exactly what Brother John Thomas said in chapter 17 of Elpis Israel. You might not be able to read it, but well, I'll read this out. He says this. He says, There is then a partial and a primary restoration of Jews before the manifestation or before you know, the Lord appears, which is to serve as the nucleus or the basis of future operations in the restoration of the rest of the tribes after he has appeared in the kingdom. So Brother John Thomas, based on Ezekiel 35 to 39, says the Jews are going to come back to the land and that, and that restoration on the mountains of Israel 1967 till now is going to form the basis and the nucleus of the kingdom of God. It's going to be focused and centred primarily there for the restoration of Israel. And then he says the pre-adventual colonisation, which is 1967 onwards, he says of Palestine will be on purely political principles. And what he's saying there is, verse 24 onwards, he says, isn't yet. So, so the giving them of a new heart, a new way, a new spirit, he says that's not phase one of their restoration. That's later. That's when the Lord has come. It's purely pr- political principles. It's purely a physical restoration to the mountains of Israel. And then he says, and the Jewish colonies will return in unbelief of the Messiahship of Jesus and of the truth as it is in him. He says they will emigrate thither as agriculturalists and traders. Now, where do you think he got that from, agriculturalists? Would well, you remember Ezekiel 36, verse 9? For behold, I am for you, mountains of Israel, and I will turn unto you, and you shall be tilled and sown. So when they come back, pre the return of Jesus, um, they're going to till and sow the land. And John Thomas picks that up and says, they're going to come back as agriculturalists and traders in the hope of ultimately establishing their commonwealth, but more immediately of getting rich in silver and gold by commerce. Isn't that lovely? Ezekiel 38, I think, is where he got that from. That gold comes down to take a spoil and to take a prey. So Israel gathers silver and gold. It gathers uh, trade and commerce with India. Uh, and other places, and it says in cattle and goods, the, the spoil and the prey by their industry at home under the efe- efficient protection, protection of the British power. All of this is from our mountains of Israel prophecies in Ezekiel. And then he goes on to say, he, he kind of dumps Britain in there. We'll come back to that. And, and this their expectation will not be deceived. For before Gog invades their country, it is described by the prophet as a land of unwalled villages whose inhabitants are at rest and they dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates and possessed of silver and gold, cattle and goods, dwelling in the midst of the land, in the mountains of Israel, the midst of the land. Now, any person, it says, you've got to remember, you've got to take your minds back quite a long time here, acquainted with the present insecure condition, that's 150 years ago, not now, um, of Palestine under the Ottoman dominion must be satisfied from the testimony that some other power friendly to Israel must then have become paramount over the land. So, so John Thomas looks at his day and goes, well, it can't be the Ottoman Empire that enables Israel to come back to the mountains of Israel. Another more friendly power <coughs> must do that. And he says this is all that's needed, he says. Namely, security for life, property and Palestine will be as eligible for Jewish emigration as the United States have proved for the Gentiles. So it says all they need is a power slightly friendlier than the Ottomans who allow them to have the land. And then he says this. This is the last slide. No, it's not. It's the last bit one. But to what part of the world shall we look for a power whose interests will make it willing as it is able to plant the ensign of civilization on the mountains of Israel? So in John Thomas's day, um, as it was up to 1967, there was no civilization on the mountains of Israel. So he says, well, which power is going to come and enable Israel to come and civilise and, and live civilly on the mountains of Israel. It says, the reader will doubtless anticipate my reply from what has gone before. It says, I know not whether the men who at present contrive the foreign policy of Britain entertain the idea of assuming the sovereignty of the Holy Land and of promoting its colonisation by the Jews. It says, their present intentions, however, are of no importance one way or the other because they will be compelled by events soon to happen. It's a very bold statement. He says, it doesn't really matter what the foreign minister is saying. He says, they're going to be compelled by the power of God to do it. Under existing circumstances, heaven and earth combined could not move them to attempt. So he says, Britain's going to be the ones who give a mandate to enable Israel to come back to the land. And then he says, the present decisions of statesmen are destitute of stability. 
shooting star in the political firmament is sufficient to disturb all the forces of their systems and to still stultify all the theories of their political astronomy. It says, the finger of God has indicated a course to be pursued by Britain, which cannot be evaded and which her councillors will not only be willing but eager to adopt when the crisis comes upon them. And so it happened. The Balfour Declaration was a British mandate that enabled the Jews to go back to the land. So it was a letter dated the 2nd of November 1917 from the United... They were compelled, as John Thomas said, compelled by the power of God to do this. And so they say, His Majesty's government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home (coughs) for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So, this British power compelled, uh, came and did this. 1948 came, Israel come back to the land, but they're still not in the mountains of Israel. And so the Six-Day War happens where they capture, amongst other places, the Gaza Strip, Golan Heights, East Jerusalem, and in particular the West Bank, where the mountains of Israel are situated. And so this came to pass. Phase one is now undergoing. Israel are now back in the land. Um, the primary and partial restoration of Israel is pretty much finished. And Gog is pretty much, uh, I think, on its way down. And so you see settlements like this. That's the settlement of Kedumim. Um, Post-1967, you can see that they're, they're the mobile homes that are going up in their forces on, on, on the mountains of Israel. Unwalled villages, no bars nor gates, just a safe place to live for Israel. And so they are there living in, in safety. Not a kingdom safety, we're not expecting that. Go comes before the kingdom. But they're safe. You think about Israel's past and how they've lived before. This is pretty much as safe as it's ever been for Israel, on the mountains of Israel, in unwalled villages. And so, those two phases, we're, we're part way through, if not nearly done, with phase one. The primary and partial restoration of Israel back to the mountains of Israel. And this is what Ezekiel 36 said, wasn't it? They are at hand to come. And in 1967 they came and they tilled and they sowed that land. And this is what Ezekiel 36 is all about. Bringing Israel back, not to Jerusalem, but to the mountains of Israel. So where did John Thomas get his ideas from? Well, let's just go to Ezekiel 38. Notice what uh, God says to Gog. He says, Gog's going to come down against the mountains of Israel... Uh, and, he, and, and God tells Gog what Gog's going to find. And, and he says this, After many years, verse 8, thou shalt be visited. In the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. And is gathered out of many people. So when Gog comes down, there's going to be Jews on the mountains of Israel that have come from all nations, from, scatter, from being scattered. Uh, which, uh, and is going to come against the mountains of Israel, which have been waste. But it is brought back out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So all these hilltop settlements that are springing up on the mountains of Israel are providing that safety to Israel. Okay, so verse 9 then says, Gog, you're going to ascend and you're going to come like a storm. You're going to come like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time, shall things come into thy mind. So as God comes down and descends from the north parts, he's going to think. Something's going to come into his mind, and he's going to think an evil thought. Verse 11, Thou shalt say, I will go up to the land. Notice that, go up. I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely on the mountains of Israel, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil. This is the evil thought. They're gonna, they, they look at the, Israel, the mountains of Israel, they see uh, the goods they've accumulated, the gold and the silver and perhaps gas and oil and all those other things that have become part of what we now know as Israel. They're going to try to come down and take a spoil and to take a prey. To turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited. So, so what God says to Gog is, The mountains of Israel were desolate, but when you come against them, they're going to be inhabited. And that's what we see on the mountains of Israel today. We see an inhabited mountains of Israel. And it says, upon the people that are already gathered out of the nations. 
That's why John Thomas knew there was going to be a pre adventure colonization of the mountains of Israel, as he calls it. Because this verse says, they are already gathered before Go comes down. They've gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the, in the midst of the land, in the centre of the earth. centre of the land is the mountains of Israel. Verse 13. Um, no, we don't need to read verse 13. That's what Gog is going to find. He's going to find an Israel that are not only on the mountains of Israel, not only are their cities and, and settlements built, but they're dwelling there safely and they've got a lot of riches and wealth. That's what Gog is going to find. That's exactly the description. If you went to Israel to the mountains today, you would see all of those things. And the same thing is true. We read it, Ezekiel 36, verse 8 to 14. We won't read it again. It's exactly the same. You're going to be back. The Israel are at hand to come. You're going to sit, till the land. You're going to sow the land. I will multiply men, verse 10, upon you. And the cities, verse 10, shall be inhabited and the ways shall be builded. Notice how verse 8, 9, and 10, and, and 11 of Ezekiel 36 are the words that are picked up in Ezekiel 38 when God speaks to Gog and says, this is what you'll find. He finds exactly what God says the mountains of Israel will look like when he speaks to the mountains of Israel in chapter 36. It's the same prophecy. One spoken to Gog, one spoken to the mountains of Israel. But it's the same events. It's the post-1967, but pre-return of the Lord. He also, I I would have thought, had 37 in mind. Notice this. This is absolutely beautiful here, Ezekiel 37. This picture of Israel that are decimated in AD 70 to the point where there's no hope. Their bones are dried up. You know, shall these bones ever live? Is the question. And then bit by bit, they are restored. Firstly, the bones come together. Phase one of the return of Israel, post-1967. Then flesh and sinews are put on them. Suggest that we have that today. But what we don't have yet is the spirit breathed into them. We don't have the bones living. And we certainly don't have Israel standing up as an exceeding great army. But we part way there. Phase one is almost done. And this is what was said in verse 7 of Ezekiel 37. I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bones. That's Israel and Judah together, bones coming together on the mountains of Israel, we're told. And when I behold, beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them. The skin covered them above, and there was no breath in them. Sorry, that, but there was no breath in them. And I think that's where we are today. They have the bones together in, the, in Israel. They have the flesh and the sinews. In other words, they've got all the agriculture. They've got the cities. They've got the peace. They've got the safety. What they don't have yet is the breath put in them. Verse 9. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. I think this is future. The breath came into them and they lived and they stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Well, that's clearly future. And so then he says unto me, verse 11, son of man, these bones are not Judah, they're not Israel, they're the whole house of Israel. Judah and Israel together, behold, they say our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we are cut off from our parts. That's the scattering I suggest of AD 70. Therefore prophesy and say, I will open your graves And he'll cause you to come up out of your graves amongst the nations and bring you into the land of Israel. That's 1967, 1948 onwards. Brought them into the land of Israel. They're there. The bones are there, but the breath is not yet in them. And ye shall know, verse 13, that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and I shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall plant you in your own land. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. You can see the process. You can see all of these chapters, 36, 7 and 8, the gradual progression of the restoration of Israel in its two phases. So they're physically restored, then they're spiritually restored. So in the context there, we've just put, we have the bones, probably perhaps the flesh and the sinews as well. We don't exactly know, do we? don't exactly know where we are. So let's just go through this in a little more detail, and then we'll look into the events of 1967 onwards, if we get time, and just see how these passages have completely been fulfilled. And Israel are are now ready. They're in the land and they're waiting. The land is prepared. The people are prepared for Gog to come. So phase one of the restoration of Israel. This is essentially the process that we're we're told. Um, They're scattered and they become two nations, we're told. Um, In chapter 35 and 36, we'll just skip through this. We won't read all the verses. Um, 
Then the enemy, we're told, appoints um, the mountains of Israel. The MOI is mountains of Israel. I, I couldn't keep typing here. So the mountains of Israel as their own. So someone else looks at the scattered Israel in AD 17 and says, we'll take the mountains. That's what Eden did. They tried to take the mountains as their own. And then 1948 came along. They returned to the land in a secular movement. On, as John Thomas says, on purely political principles, they come back. Uh, well, there they are. They're back. That's what we're told. Verse 24. Um, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries. That began in 1940. It's not yet complete, but it began at that point. And then 1967 comes along, which is the key date for the mountains of Israel. Um, the land blossoms and is tilled and sown. Um, verse 8 and 9 that we've looked at. Israel then, verse 12 and 13, rebuild and inhabit the desolate cities on the mountains of Israel and that desolate area as it was. Um, chapter 37 puts it very differently, but it says AD 70, their hope was lost. 1948, the bones came together. Then 1967, until now, um, the flesh and the sinews are put on them. And then Ezekiel 38 and 39, we've already seen, so we won't go there. Details are exactly the same. So the primary and partial restoration of Israel, before the return of the Lord Jesus, I suggest is pretty much finished. I don't see anything in these prophecies concerning phase one that hasn't yet happened. I think the land is ready for Gog. The land is ready for Gog to come. If you think about the description that we've just read in Ezekiel 38 of what God says to Gog, this is what you'll witness, then you look at the land today, that is exactly what, if they came down today, that's what they would witness. Well, phase two then has this. Gog invades the mountains of Israel. Gog is then destroyed on the mountains of Israel. Israel multiplies on the mountains of Israel. And then the whole house of Israel, uh, Judah and Israel, possess the mountains of Israel forever. Okay. Uh, And then chapter 36 tells us that Israel are ashamed of their old ways. And the heathen and Israel, both Jew and Gentile, know and acknowledge that that, that God, he he is Yahweh. He was the one who's in control. Uh, God then sanctifies them and the idols are removed. And then we're told that a, a temple or sanctuary Chapter 37 is established. Ezekiel 37, again, different language. The two sticks are joined together as the whole house of Israel possessed the land. Then the breath comes into them uh, and then they stand up an exceeding great army. Uh, And then Ezekiel 38 and 9, well, we've seen all of that as well. So it's all the same thing. And then finally what happens here is um, they're given a new heart and a new spirit. They're cleansed with water. Uh, They walk in God's ways. Uh, and then there's that final acknowledgement at the end of chapter 36 in verse 28 um, that um, he is their God and they are his people. They have one shepherd and one king. Okay, So that's, that's phase two. That's the spiritual restoration of Israel post return of Jesus. That's when the bones live and that's when Israel are an exceeding great army. And Ezekiel 39 doesn't particularly focus on it because it's focused on Gog, not on, on Israel. So that's really where we get to. So when we think about what we'd expect to happen in phase one, I'm calling it phase one, it's, you know, it's just the language you're using. So the land, we'd expect it to be inhabited by Israel, tilled and sown, dwellings built, and them dwelling safely. I, can, I think we can say all of those have happened or are happening. The house of Israel, well, they return to the mountains, they build habitations, they, they, they uh, engage in agriculture, and they get riches to themselves, gold, silver, cotton and goods, where they've done all of that. Then the overall result is that the nucleus, as John Thomas says, of a future kingdom is created and the mountains of Israel are prepared for Gog's unsuccessful invasion. I'm going to suggest that's done as well. And then when when phase two comes along, when the Lord finally does come and Israel are fully restored on the mountains of Israel, well, what what does the land expect then? Well, all of Israel inhabit it. The cities and wastes are then completely rebuilt. There's no more invasions and there's complete safety. There's two different safeties here. There's a pre-kingdom safety, which is comparative to the, to the rest of their treatment amongst the nations. And then there's the, the true safety. In the house of Israel, where they, the, the two nations become one again. AD 70, the one became two. Two become one again. And they're given a new heart, a new spirit. They cleanse, they repent, they build the temple, they become this great army. And then the overall result of that, we're told, is that God is sanctified amongst the heathen and Israel, and both know him. And then the whole house of Israel become his people and he is their God. And these two things are happening. So in the final few minutes that we have, let's just have a look at 
the last 49 years since 1967. Bearing in mind all those prophecies of what what Gog will witness when it comes against the mountains of Israel. Has <coughs> have we seen that? Well, I just want to do this in three parts. They'll be fairly quick, particularly the first two. So what happened 1948 to 1967? What, what kind of went on in that period? Um, and then I want to ask that question, why is the West Bank important? Because that is a really important question, because Israel didn't have the West Bank, where the mountains of Israel are situated, in 1948, but they got them in 67. Palestine, um, even in the last few weeks, but it's been saying it for a long time, as part of this two-state solution in Israel, it wants a few areas. It wants East Jerusalem, um, which Israel got in 67. It wants the Gaza Strip, which Israel got back in 1967. And it wants the West Bank and the mountains of Israel, which Israel got back in 67. And it wants the Golan Heights, which Israel got back in 1967. Basically, what, what the Palestinians want is a two-state solution to go back to the 1948 position that we were in. But why do they want the West Bank? Why does Go come against the West Bank? Why does Go come against the mountains of Israel? Why doesn't it just go straight into Jerusalem? And other questions we'll ask there. So why is the West Bank important? And then have a quick look at, at what's happening today. So 1948 to 67, Israel do not occupy the mountains of Israel. Now, I've left my clicky pointer thing, so you're not going to have to see, but there's that, I've kind of blown it up there a little bit, which isn't hugely helpful, I appreciate it, but there's this green line around the West Bank, um, which is the pre-1967 border, or the 1949 armistice borders, those agreements that took place there. So, the West Bank they didn't have, so you can see they had the coastal plain, which is essentially uh, right next to the Mediterranean Sea, and other areas, of course, but they didn't have this military strategic position on, on the mountains of Israel. And, it, and it's kind of shown fairly graphically here. Um, Israel from 1948 to 1967 were incredibly vulnerable, hugely vulnerable, because if you imagine an invading force coming, like Go, for example, say, coming against the mountains of Israel, with the height that you have on the mountains of Israel, it wouldn't take much to push Israel from the coastal plain into the Mediterranean Sea. So the whole time from 48 to 67, Israel were worried, concerned, that they were going to be pushed into the Mediterranean Sea by any kind of invading force. So to gain the mountains of Israel was huge. It got rid of a lot of their vulnerability and enabled them to kind of have the, a, a safer environment. Because if you look at the cross section that's on my screen but not yours, so we get to it, through the land, you can see they're pre-1967, they're kind of given that little strip down the coastal plain. Um, and then in 96, which is kind of, you can see just from that how vulnerable it is really. And then 1967 onwards, uh, the West Bank, they gain back. So you get not only get a big chunk of land, but you actually get the height advantage that any military power wants and that you want as uh, security in any strategic defence strategy as well. And also you've got the huge advantage here that any army coming from the east is going to struggle because they've got a 4,200 feet um, ridge to climb because of the, the Jordan Valley that's the lowest point on earth. So you are, by gaining the mountains of Israel, I don't know if I've explained this well or not, but by gaining the mountains of Israel, you're protecting yourself from an, an eastern invasion, effectively, you know, partially at least, and you're uh, protecting yourself from being driven into the Mediterranean Sea. So gaining the mountains of Israel um, not only started kicking off these prophecies of Ezekiel 34 to 39, but it also... Um, gain, gave them this, this security for defence and safety that they can have, a, they've got a good advantage, got a good view, and that they can effectively control that land. So, why is the West Bank important? I think you just answered that. So, um, there's this quote here, a very famous quote, which says, Whoever has control of the mountains of Israel controls the country. From a military point of view and from a defence point of view, you want the mountains. That's why Gogol came against the mountains of Israel, to gain that strategic importance, that military advantage. So it can then do what it intends to do. I mean, it's going to be destroyed, so it's not going to get very far. But that's why, they can, that's why Palestine, the Palestinians, want um, the West Bank. They want the mountains of Israel as part of the two-state solution. And these, these are not, not my words. These are words of um, a fairly famous writer. He says, due to its location and topography, the West Bank, Judah and Samaria, remember that cross-section, the mountains of Israel, has played a vital role in Israel's national security. So think about the peace and safety that Gog... <laughs> Um, comes down against the mountains of Israel, the gaining of the West Bank in 1967 brings about security and safety, since it was captured by the IDF in 1967. It says the West Bank is relatively small, um, but it's situated immediately adjacent to the Israeli coastal plain, which they had uh, pre-67, 
uh, where more than 70% of Israel's population and 80% of its industrial capacity are located. Why the high percentages? Well, because when this was written, until recently, they hadn't had the, the mountains for long. They were in the coastal plain because of the armistice border. They had no choice. But slowly, bit by bit, they're now moving away from there into the mountains of Israel so that they can fulfill these prophecies. Well, not so they can, but they are. And then another aspect of the strategic importance of the West Bank emanates from its role as a barrier. So we've thought about the West, the coastal plain, but think about the East. It protects them from the vulnerable, uh, sorry, from the West, the coastal plain, from armed attack from the East. So protection to the West and also an armed attack to the East because of this 4,200 foot barrier from the depths of the Jordan, the Dead Sea. So it says then, the last paragraph, the eastern slopes of the mountain ridge, so that's the, um, the Dead Sea, that ridge, uh, provide the only practical alternative for a defence line for the Israeli army while it completes its uh, reserve mobilisation to deal with the threat. So they're bringing about the safety of their own means. And we won't go through this, but effectively we're told here um, the West Bank mountain ridge contributes to Israeli security in other ways, and we won't look at them. But it's all about security, it's all about safety. That's why you want the mountains of Israel, the West Bank. From a purely human and political point of view, you gain safety. So Gog, when it comes down, comes to uh, the mountains of Israel, who are in unwalled villages without bars and gates. So that's 1948 to 67. That was the importance of that period of time. It gained them this land. Uh, and effectively what's happened since then is uh, many of the Jews have returned to the mountains. We'll look at that in a, in a minute. Um, they've set up these mobile homes. They've set up education. They're basically living there um, as a permanent dwelling. And this is what we've said. Zeke 38. They are at hand to come. They will till and sow this land. So the population then. Um, look at the second half. The, the West Bank settlement population um, since 2003 to 2008 went up 31%, and then 2008 to 2013 went up a further 23%. So from 2003 to 2013, effectively the population of the West Bank, the mountains of Israel, increased by 50%. This is absolutely, God says, I will multiply Israel upon you, God says in Ezekiel 36. I'll multiply, verse 11 of 36, I'll multiply men upon you, my people Israel. 50% increase in the land. Uh, and, and notice the settlements inside the barrier have gone up 32% in five years and then another 23% in the next five years. And since 2013, it's carried on. They're, they're populating the mountains of Israel. This, as John Thomas says, primary and partial restoration of Israel to the land that will form the nucleus of the future kingdom. Population has gone from 690,000 in 1970 to 2.7 million in the West Bank. It's a huge, huge increase. Um, of course, a lot of it's still Arab, Palestinian, but Israel control the mountains. It's in their control. This was said in July 2012. The number of Jewish settlers in the West Bank grew by more than 15,000 in the past year to reach a total that exceeds 350,000 for the first time. And notice this has almost doubled in the past 12 years. I saw that on, on that, those graphs. Almost double in the past 12 years. And this also is in addition to the 300,000 Jews that have gone into uh, East Jerusalem, which is the other key area that Israel strategically took in 67. And then an update then in, in 2014 says that the, the population, the second bit of, of Jewish settlers in the occupied West Bank has surged during Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's years in office, going at more than twice the pace of Israel's overall population. So... So the mountains of Israel are multiplying in people at over twice the rate of the rest of Israel. It's the focus. It's what's happening. Israel are migrating to the mountains exactly as Ezekiel 36 and 37 and 38 prophesied of. Um, I won't look at any of that. Um, and then this statement here that in all the settler population has more than doubled in the, in the 21 years since Israel and the Palestinians have been engaged in an on-off peace process aimed at the partition of the Holy Land. And then this year, 2016, um, interestingly, the Palestinians want to establish an independent state in the West Bank. Surprise, surprise. Um, Gaza and East Jerusalem, the, the, the pre-1967 areas, because they're the strategically important places. That's what they want. But then this, this statement here, there are now about 550,000 Jewish settlers. That's 200,000 more than 2013, if my math is right there, 
in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. It's just multiplying at a huge rate. Now, this is really interesting. So of all the areas that Israel gained in 1967, the, the red line is the increase in the Golan height, you know, the Gaza Strip population. The green line is the increase in the Golan height population. But then the yellow line, which is obviously positive, East Jerusalem. So, so a lot of Israel have migrated to, the, to East Jerusalem. And the other key area, of course, the mountains of Israel, the West Bank, is the blue line, the huge increase. So of all the territories that Israel got back in 67, it's the West Bank where Israel are migrating to, exactly as these prophecies had. And then interestingly, in terms of leaving the nations, um, Israel are basically, they're out of Egypt, pretty much. Um, there's less than 10 of them, I don't know if these are right, there's less than 10 of them left in Iraq. Um, um, Syria, there's not many either. And Elam, modern day Persia, there's 20 to 25,000. And then you look in 1948, there was that many. So Israel have left the nations and they're coming back to not East Jerusalem, or the Gaza Strip, or the Golan Heights, they're coming back to the mountains of Israel. Hear this word of the Lord I will multiply my people Israel upon you. This is all happening. So they're also told that, um, well, chapter 36 and verse. Nine told us that they would be tilled and sown. So God says when Israel comes back, they're going to engage in agriculture. Um, And I'm not going to take you through this, but take it from me or take the slides to prove it yourself. It's exactly what has happened. Um, In fact, this one here, the agricultural minister, and this is this year, um, has just allocated 70 million shekels to infrastructure projects in the West Bank. So he said 70 million pounds is yours. Go and build infrastructure in the mountains of Israel build settlements, build roads, build whatever you want. They're going to inhabit that land. It's the focus for Israel. And then this says here, the Zionist ideal of Jewish agriculture, remember John Thomas said that, they'll come back as agriculturalists and traders. It says the Zionist ideal of Jewish agriculture in the land of Israel reached the occupied West Bank within months of the end of the 1967 war. The agricultural takeover of large swathes of land requires relatively few resources and time in comparison with actual construction or the establishment of outposts. Within weeks, months, at the end of 1967, Israel were there, tilling and sowing the land. So in summary, Israel removed in AD 70. Gone. Our hope is lost. Two nations. And this, this British mandate came in 1917 that they would go back to the land. It happened in 48, but not to the mountains of Israel. So not in the context of these prophecies. But then, in, in 67... They took all of this. And what's there today was this obviously constant conflict with the Palestinians. That goes on. We have the rebuilding settlements, the relocating to the mountains. Um, Israel control it, but it's, 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 um, it's shared with the Palestinians at present. There's agriculture. Interestingly, I've, I've deleted the slides because I knew this would happen in terms of time. Um, but there's all sorts of information about how the EU are opposing Israel on the mountains of Israel. So the EU are coming in and building Palestinian settlements and Israel are knocking down the EU Palestinian settlements. And there's that conflict between the EU and Israel on the mountains of Israel because the EU are very much pushing a two-state solution uh, rather than uh, the land being given back to Israel. So Gog, why would Gog come to the mountains of Israel? Why would they come to this land here? And notice this. Whoever controls the mountains controls the country. It's where you go to gain control of the land first. Before you engage in any warfare, you control the country. And I think it's because of its, as we said, the military importance of it. It's the place they want to go. And secondly, (coughs) Gog's going to come down, we're told, Ezekiel 38. They're coming to destroy the nucleus of the kingdom of God that's created before Christ returns uh, and before Gog invades. That's what they come down to do. And they're going to find a land of unwalled villages without bars and gates. They're going to find cities inhabited. They're going to find people gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land on the mountains of Israel. It's all there, brothers and sisters. It's all there. Gog, while the land is ready, the people are ready for Gog's invasion. So they're going to invade and they're going to be destroyed and buried there And then Israel are going to engage in the the second stage of their restoration where they're given a new heart, a new spirit, a new way. And they're going to walk in God's laws and they're going to stand up as this great and exceeding army 
uh, to conquer the rest of the world. And, and so it's exciting, isn't it? It, wasn't, it was only 49 years ago that Israel had the mountains of Israel. And I would say, I think, that all the prophecies regarding the mountains of Israel, of what you'd expect to see before the Lord comes, are all there, ready to go. The land is being tilled, the land is being occupied, the cities are being built. They're in this relative safety without bars and gates. The time of the kingdom, and this could be very soon.